We have Willow on a Sunday and a Monday, uh, so she stays overnight with us on a, on a Sunday. So yeah, it's, it's one of the things where if she has a good night's sleep, then we're okay on a Monday. Okay. And she decides she wants to get up at five o'clock in the morning and start playing, and then we have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and start playing. And she's, we've done dual parenting with a lesbian couple. Okay. So the idea is so that we have Willow uh, sort of three days a week, they have uh, four. Um, and it's at its moments, it's, it's, been, it's been challenging, but that was a decision that we made. We basically... Uh-huh. Uh, knew, knew this couple that I've known for about 20 years since going out in Paradise Factory um, <laughs> and then sort of you know we had a conversation and then yeah to, till two years ago Willow was born. I'm very honoured today to be sitting with Carl Austin Bian. I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. Um, politician, outwardly spoken and out LGBT politician or the youngest LGBT, one of the youngest mayors anyway in Manchester, and um, just the uh, kind of groundbreaking in every which way. So welcome to hear here, Carl. I'm very yeah, no, honoured to absolutely. have you. No, and it's a pleasure because uh, you know we, we, we've sort of seen each other over the years and sort of hello, how are you doing? But then to mm. sort of you know actually have this catch up is it, great. Oh, I didn't realise that you're a crumbsel boy. Yes. You're from North Manchester, yeah. in the hood. Yeah. yeah. Where, where about, is that where, where you're from as well? Because I was born in North Manchester General Crumpsall Hospital. Were you a Crumpsall Hospital? Guy? I was. I was born in Crumpsall Hospital as well. And my Children's Ward. Yes. Like, your mum worked there? Yeah, my mum worked there. Um, she, was, she was like, uh, she, yeah, she worked there for, for my whole sort of uh, growing up sort of period. Um, really? For, for one of the consultants, but also for the geriatric day department as well for the, for the first time. Okay. Um, so yeah, I used to spend a lot of time at Crumpsall Hospital, and when I wasn't visiting my mum, I'd spend a lot of time at Boothall Hospital with little broken arms or broken legs. As <laughs> you were accident pro like me. Yeah, very. <laughs> so how was your childhood? Did you like school? Which school did you go to? Well, I went, I went to Crumpsall Lane. So I went to Crumpsall Lane Primary, uh, Infant, Primary, and then Junior School. And yeah. then I went to Abram Moss, uh, the okay. old building, before it was uh, knocked down, demolished, and rebuilt. Um, do you know what? I, I tried at school. I'm just not very academic. Okay. Um, I, you know, I remember, I remember my school days where it was a case of, I, you know, I, I enjoyed it as best I could, but as I say, not, not academic. And I left school at 16 with, with one GCSE. In okay. Uh, so I think that says a lot. It doesn't. Yeah. And I just remember, you know, I, as I say, I, I, I I, I, I wouldn't say I was a loner, but I didn't, I didn't have a group of friends as such. I'd, I'd sort of dip in and dip out of different yeah, friends. Yeah. So I got on with people um, and I suppose I, I just sort of got on with things. But at the same time, in the back of my mind, as someone who felt very different from a lot of the other people in school. Um, and when I tried to sort of talk to my mum about it, mum would say, oh, it's a phase you're going through. And yeah. what I mean by that is sort of realizing that that you know my sexuality and uh, knowing was that, that I was, yeah, it, it, you know, I knew from the age of sort of five or six, okay, um, that I was different. And I remember even even at school there'd be sort of there'd be instances where I'd end up engaged in a situation with with, a, with another lad at school, and yeah. and I'd, I'd I'd tell my mom because I wanted to know what that was, and she's just like, you know, she'd sort of brush it off and just sort of say it's a phase you're going through. So I think. Um, and even at my school at that sort of time, I think I joined Boys Brigade because my brothers were in it. So it was a sort of youth organisation. Yeah. Again, probably to try and sort of, I wouldn't say to, to sort of as a way of making friends, but just a sort of way of trying to fit in with society. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it was all right. Didn't have a great, um, a great relationship with my dad. I did with my mum. I was very close to my mum. Um, and I had two other brothers, David and Paul, who were both older than me. The holidays would be sort of split between the parks or Fallowfield Library or yeah. Withinshaw with Library. <laughs> yeah, we went to Withinshaw Park, you know, with yeah. the little, with the little uh, lake seats. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's what roots you as well a little bit, isn't it? To sort yeah. of having family around you and sort of having that sort of bit of move around. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you mentioned something about the boys club and I wanted to know whether that, kind of whether that set the um tone really for you going on into the RAF 
Well, it, it's there a link boy, in any way? Well, I suppose in a way there is, because with, with Boys Brigade, it was very sort of disciplined. It was about, you know, uniform and making sure that, you you know, we used to have to sort of do like you go to Sunday school, you'd go to church, you'd have to go and do the parades. Yeah. So it, gave, it, it instilled discipline with you. And it, and it, you know, quite a lot of the time, it, it was quite a lot of the nights of the week. Um, but I think part of going into the, the Air Force was... Um, I'd always wanted to be, I'd always wanted to be a fireman as a, as a child, you know, you yeah. have a little dream. Yeah, yeah. And, and then as I was, as I left school at, at 16, um, I was like, I ended up, because I, I, I could have gone to college, I could have gone to Sheena Simon, um, yeah. but then I got a job. For my very first job, I was a butcher for half a day and I hated it. <laughs> uh, I walked out at the dinner time. Um, and then I did some various other jobs, I uh, went to work at Thornton's um, and and I spent a couple of years just sort of trying to find out who I was and what I was doing. Um, yeah. And at the same time, um, from, from sort of the age of like 14, 15, knowing that I was probably gay, I went through quite a big sort of denial stage. Yeah. Uh, and putting myself in so many situations that you're thinking, how the heck um, did I manage to survive that? Uh, because... Because back then we didn't have sort of dating apps, you know, yeah. the age, yeah. you know, we, we, when we look at it, so even when it came to, you know, we had the, the whole HIV AIDS epidemic. Yes. And I remember the adverts, I remember the tombstones, so I remember I. The, 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 the icebergs. And we were basically being told that it was this big gay disease that if totally. you were gay, you were going to die. So Terror, I think fear. It, it was horrible. And, you know, we even, had our, we, even, we even had the chief constable of Greater Manchester, <laughs> yeah, and telling us that we're going to die in a cesspit of our own making. Yeah. So I think I then tried to take myself away from that situation. I went to work nights um, for WH Smith for a while. But then I, I, I went to see my brother who was in the Air Force, uh, 17 and a half. And I realised he had a fire service in the Air Force. So I thought, oh, I could I'll try and apply for that. So I applied and it took me 18 months to get in. Um, and I think, in a way, part of me joining the Air Force was me running away from being gay, me running mm -hmm. away from, um, for, from HIV and AIDS, thinking mm -hmm. that I was going to catch this disease. But, uh, and I loved the Air Force from day one. I, lo I absolutely loved it from day one. But also from day one, I realised that I was living a double, treble, sometimes a quadruple life. Because yeah. when I was in the Air Force, I'd go and do the same as what the other lads were doing. You know, I was 19, 20, so it was about going out, meeting girls, going clubbing, but then yeah. what I would do is I'd come back to Manchester and on, say, say I'd come back on a weekend, I'd come back on a Friday night on the train. I'd then go and find someone who yeah. I could just sleep hang out with, with. Yeah. hang out with, um, end up staying a night in this, wherever it was, whether it was a house, whether it was a hostel, whatever it was, um, as my fix. And then get, get up in the next morning go to mum and dad's house and make out that I just got off the train that yeah. morning to sort of come and see him. And, and then you realise, when you look back, you're thinking, oh my God, how much... What, 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 yeah, what, you know, you were putting yourself in so much danger. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and as I say, we didn't have mobile phones then, we didn't have any sort of technology. So, you know, I'm not ashamed of any of those days. It was all no, part of No, because everyone up. came through the same and, thing. Yeah, it was seedy. It was, it was dangerous. It um, was. We put... We put ourselves in so much uh, situations, and I remember, you know, e even to the fact of, um, you know, even when we did sort of get over that little bit, and we managed to go out, and you'd be going back with people on a, on a Friday night or a Saturday night after a club, you still put yourselves in in some sort of really scary situations. Especially as I say, we didn't have any technology bit back then. We didn't know. <laughs> it's like you go to you go out on a Saturday night, and and you go and dance in your corner, um, you know, a bit later on, and then every week you'd be in the same place you'd have these group of friends these are your disco friends you probably didn't even know the surname you knew them all everyone had everyone had a, everyone had a name like you know uh D dj paul or sort of balloon, balloon you know everyone had just random yeah. names because yeah that's how you Keep remember them from that night <laughs> yeah yeah che yeah cheesy paul and and it was that sort of thing where it was a case of but you didn't know anything about these people you then are going back to a chill out afterwards yeah. um, and just sort of, you know, 
having a few more drinks with them and then sort of Sunday afternoon sort of drif dr drifting off and then you might meet them back again later on to go to Danceteria. But <laughs> you knew nothing about these people, but these, these, these are your mates. These are like your closest friends at that time of your life. Yeah. Apart from the people that I'm probably friends with still from the RAF, the friends that I've sort of still forged with, the people that came to our wedding, the people that, that, that are still a part of our life or my life, are people that uh, at some point back 20, 25, 30 years ago, I've probably slept with yeah. or built <laughs> With or take the uh, with, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, when we laugh about it when we go for dinner about who who you not slept with around the table. You know, if we go back that far, but, exactly. But, but 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 you are right there. It's like, and then there'd be like people like Sonny. You know, I've known Sonny for, for about the same amount of time, and then the, the whole sort of um going going around the village and sort of meeting those people. They're, they're the people that did shape you, did make you, and sort of turned totally. you into the person you are today. And grounded you in that sense totally. as well to tell to tell you when you're being an idiot, yeah. and to remind you when you you know you need to sort of just sort of wind your neck wind in a little in. bit. Because yeah. <laughs> we've all I got love opinions. That you use that phrase. I love that you use that phrase. <laughs> so then, so you're living this kind of quadruple life. You've gone into to the RAF, but how was the RAF experience really? And what happened to kind of explode that for you? Okay. Um, I mean, I absolutely loved the Air Force. From, as I say, from day one, I loved it. It was very much a case of, I, I think, as, as you sort of said before about Boys Brigade, I think it was a bigger version of Boys Brigade with the fact of the discipline. And I, I you know, I, I, I get discipline completely. I, you know, I understand the reason why we do certain things for you know, why you polish your shoes and why you sort of, you know, you, you, you do things in a certain way. And I, I think I was very lucky because I was, I was myself, um, as I say, I, I managed to go to, did my basic training at Swinderby, then went to Manston in Kent. Yeah. Then from there, I went to RAF Chibna, which is in North Devon. Um, and that was just like a holiday camp, but it was brilliant. And it was the first post and it was a dream posting straight away. Um, and while I was there, so because I was leading this double treble life, I ended up seeing this girl who was on the camp with as well. Um, we started having a relationship at the same time. I'm still having relationships with men. doing what I was doing yeah. with men. Um, and she fell pregnant and we ended up getting engaged on my 21st birthday. Um, and then a few weeks later, probably about two or three weeks later, she had a miscarriage. Right. So I just thought, do you know what? They, they, I got engaged for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, so I called that off. And at the same time, there'd been an aircraft crash at RAF Chibna. It was a Hawk aircraft, which is pretty similar to, well, it is similar to the, the Red Arrows. Yeah. Um, and it, it took off and the, it, it crashed on impact, hit the runway. Now, the first pilot managed to eject, but the second one, he couldn't eject. It had come off the, the runner when he tried to eject the seat. So I was one of the first firemen there. Um, I was still pretty new, um, managed to knock down the main flame mast, but I then ended up getting on top of the fuselage. Um, we pulled the canopy and then I sat on, on top of him on this live ejection seat to try and get him out. Yeah. So I struggled for a little bit. I remember his, his mask falling back and his pearly white teeth and his face was all burnt. Um, anyway, managed to get him out, but the aircraft was fully armed. Uh, there was things ricocheting off it. Uh, something that hit my helmet. So got him out and unfortunately he died about, I think it was 12 days later from oh, smoke wow. inhalation. But with that, I ended up getting the Good Show Award from the Air Force, but also the British Humane Society Bronze Award for bravery. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a, probably a turning point as well because, <clears throat> excuse me, because then I ended up, um, I then got posted to Belize. <laughs> I came back from there, came, went to Henlow in Bedfordshire. So I managed to get off to London quite a few times and, and to be myself then. And then went to Ascension Island in between here and the Falklands. Did that for nine months. And while I was there, I came back to the London Marathon uh, and did okay. a lot of charity stuff. Um, did a lot of work with Staffa. Uh, I was doing the combined services entertainment. So I was hosting them for, for the, 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 uh, the, the groups over there. And then I ended up getting the a mention in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 1996 as, for a Commander in Chief's commendation. And then when I came back from Ascension, I thought, you know, I, I just need to be myself. I was starting to feeling drained. 
Because yeah. literally, there was, there was times where I was seeing lads in Manchester or Oldham or, and then sort of they'd write to me. And when they used to write, you'd have to have the letters just signed by J or, you know, it might be called Jonathan. So you'd just be signed J and, you, you know, you'd, you'd be trying to have this conversation with other people about this girlfriend you've got back home. It's actually alive. So you have to be really yeah, careful. Yeah, yeah. But then, and also, because we didn't No, so have... it was illegal at the time anyway. Yeah, yeah, be... yeah, it was illegal at the time. But also, what we've also got to remember, it was also illegal to have sex because of the age of consent. Yeah. Because so... the age of consent for, for gay men was 21. 21, yeah. Um, they dropped it. When did yeah, they drop it? Was it, was it in the 2000s? Say, much, yeah, much later. Yeah, I want to say around about 2004, I Yeah, think. yeah. Um... <clears throat> And so, you know, I'd been doing activity, if that's the right word, sexual activity. Um, and obviously it was illegal anyway. So yeah, so, and we did, as I say, we didn't have phones or anything. So other girlfriends would phone the base and speak to them on the camp. But the camp, if you went through the camp phone system, people could listen into the phone calls right. and the conversations. So you had to sort of go and find the phone box off the camp, off the base to go and have this phone call. monitor, yeah. It was just really, really, you know, it was just... Draining. It was hard work. Yeah, draining and hard work. And so mm. I decided that you know, I just need to be true to myself. And I'd been seeing a girl in Ascension Island. She was stunning, she was beautiful, um, but it just wasn't going to work. So mm. I then decided in no on November 96 to tell my mum and dad again, and which I did. And I thought that my mum, my mum was still very upset about it and very much like, you know, your dad's going to kick you out. Well, I don't want to be here, so there's not nothing to sort of kick me yeah. out. <laughs> um, but then um, I think it, because of that, I then told a few people I was in the Air Force with and they were fine, didn't say anything. But I think I then became a bit cocksure of myself. Mm. Um, and then I ended up starting seeing a lad in Manchester um, I was very much sort of probably more open about it. Um, I then just got my promotion, which was unheard of um, in, in six years. Normally it'd be in for about nine or 12 years. And I was going to get posted to Afcent, which was in between Belgium and Holland. But then he decided to tell the Air Force that I was gay, thinking that I wouldn't get this, I wouldn't get posted abroad. I'd still stay in the Air Force. To keep you here. To keep me here. Um, but then on the fifteenth of fifteenth of April, um, nineteen ninety seven, I was marched into uh, Officer Commander's uh, personal services flight. There was a padre there, who was a vicar, uh, and RAF police there, and basically just asked me do they have homosexual tendencies. And that split second, I know that if I'd have said no, there'd have been thank you very much, but someone made an allegation. We just had to check. Um, I think I know that anyway, but. Uh, that split second as well, it made me realise that I had to be true to myself. Yeah. And and I just burst into tears. And what I also realised then, my whole life changed from that split second. I now lost my home. I lost all my friends. I lost my career that I'd signed up for for 22 years. Uh, I lost my pension. Uh, wow. I lost everything. I lost everything. So you've in gone that split from second. being absolutely sure of your career trajectory because you'd <clears> signed <throat> in for 20 years to yeah. um having the rug completely pulled out from under your feet how did yeah, you cause... come back from that well well what, what's strange with that is so if you were going to leave the armed forces back then you, you would leave but you'd have like 18 months to do transitioning so they'd give yeah. you education they did you know you You'd look at sorting out your home. You'd look at getting everything around you would be sorted out and you'd, you'd be given a nice financial package to sort of set you up and make sure that, you know, we've done all the right things and we've looked after your welfare. I was literally given 10 minutes to pack three boxes. Good girl. I wasn't, I wasn't able to say goodbye to anybody. Um, I was given a police escort um, and literally just thrown off the camp. Well, wow, so you were treated like a criminal then? I, I could have gone to prison for six months back in right. 1997. Um, I was led to believe I could have gone to prison because they were still, what they would normally do is they would go through all your stuff. They'd go through your, your, your photographs, they'd go through letters to see if there was anyone else in the Air Force who might have been um, a part That's of this. the same. Practicing. Yeah. yeah. But because I was doing a lot of stuff with SAFA, um, which is the Sailors, Soldiers and Airmen's Association. And I think because of the, the fact of getting the awards that I'd got and having exemplary service, 
I think they just were quite happy just to go, okay, we're going to suspend you for six months rather than go to prison for six months. And, I, you know, I respect the Air Force for that because I think they were just doing what they had to do because that was the rules and regulations at the time. Mm. Um, I did challenge it. I was going to say, did Blair. it feel fair? Oh. Was it fair? Well, I, well when, I, when I read my, they sent me my uh, record, uh, they sent me the, the interview, and there's nowhere on that interview that says anything derogatory other than the fact that I'm a, uh, I was homosexual. Wow. Um, and because I'm a homosexual, I'm incompatible to service life. It mentioned about how, you know, my exemplary service, it mentioned my awards, it mentioned everything that was good about me. Mm. Um, so I, that's, what my, that's what I built my case around, the fact that, look, other than who I sleep with when I'm in Manchester, it should have no effect with anything that I've done. And it's never had an effect with, my, with the Air Force career. But then it turned around, it, you know, it's a government, uh, the government, I wrote to Tony Blair, I wrote to my MP, um, Graham Stringer. Uh, I wrote to the MOD and basically they all sort of said the same sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a government decision. Uh, it's yeah. not gone through Parliament. We know that there are changes coming into the European uh, Parliament, but not yet. We've not looked at it. Uh, so because you're a, a homosexual, you are incompatible to service life and homosexuals are not allowed in the Air Force. Now, I'm more offended by the word homosexual than I am queer, faggot, anything you want to call mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. you, can call, you can call me anything you want. Um, as long as it's not done in a derogatory term. Yeah. And the reason yeah. why I'm the reason why I'm offended by homosexual is because it's written in legal. black and white, mm -hmm. legal document mm -hmm. to say the reason why I'm no fit, I'm not fit for purpose is because of being a homosexual. You know, yeah. I went from that to three months later, I'm stacking shells nights in Asda. Um, and you know, I enjoyed it. It was it was good. I you know, I had a, a nice time there, but it certainly wasn't what, no. what I was you know, it certainly wasn't what I was expecting. Was it easy but to get a job coming out of the RAF or did that did that impact in any way mm. how you moved through well, this? What, what I did, so what a lot of people will do is if they come out of the RAF fire service, they'll apply for local fire services. Yeah. So I actually applied for Stafford and for Greater Manchester Fire Service. Um, I managed to get in both. But I didn't tell either of them the fact that why I'd been why I was joining them because right. I didn't feel that it was none of their I, I business to, I, on their business. No, um, but then when I joined, when I got my contract for Great Manchester Fire Service, um, and I told them, they told me that I wasn't um, I wasn't to, to tell the other recruits because it might have an effect on their life. training. I don't want my, my life to have, have, have been built on this. Yeah, you know, you know, I'm quite yeah. happy to sort of. You know, wh why do a job for 30 years if you're not happy? Why do a job for 30 minutes if you're not happy? Well, what happened in that gap? Because interestingly enough, in all the research that I've done, there is that 10 year gap. I was like, what happened? What happened? So what but, did you yeah. do? Yeah. Um, so what happened? So between, so for, between 99 when I left the fire service, um, I'd also come across a competition, as you said before, Mr. Mr. Gay, Gay UK. Mr. Gay UK. <laughs> and... <laughs> I went, I, I went for that, and that, the first time I did it, it was in a Paradise Factory. Yeah. So I won, I won Mr. Gay Manchester 99, because it, it, there was a weird year, because it was 99-2000. So I won that one um, in 99-2000, and it was very much like a, a beauty pageant sort of thing. But I then, when I went to the final in Birmingham in the 2000, uh, I came second overall. But one thing that I learned in that whole process was I was looking at these people and they were either muscle Marys, they were either, um, you know, mincing queens. Yeah. They were, you know, they, they, all they, the they, categories. It, it, all it, the it, categories. It was, it, it was very stereotypical of what you'd expect from the gay scene. Yeah. Now, I felt, for me, so I felt that I could bring more to that. And what I wanted to do... Um, and not this whole sort of change the world and all this sort of stuff. But it was very much a case of like, I wanted to normalise being gay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think because I'd, because I'd been in the Air Force and because I'd been in a fire service and I'd done shelf stacking, I'd done normal jobs. And I felt that all you ever saw from the gay scene was stereotypical gays mm -hmm. or your Larry Grayson's, your Julian Clary's, your mm -hmm. Sean Tuttle's gay, um, you know, and I just wanted to sort of go, you know, we're normal people inside. It doesn't matter what, you know, we don't have to sort of play up this camp. You know, there was a lot back in the 80s, it was very clone. Um, yeah. How the image would be very, uh, 
um, the way it was done. So I thought, no, no, I'm gonna, I just wanted to, to normalize it. So I ended up that year for 2001. So I went for it again in Essential. Uh, I won Mr. Gay Manchester again for 2001. Then it was done on a phone vote that year. So it was about, so I went round to all the different Pride events because it made me realize that, you know, if we're in Manchester, Birmingham, London, Brighton, it's brilliant. You know, our gay scene was fantastic. But if you lived in Shropshire, if you lived in Derby and you had to go to Curzons, or if you lived in, you know, if you lived in Rochdale or Bury or Bolton, yeah, you know, and it was a case of nothing. You know, mm. they might have a, a gay night in the back room of a pub on the Thursday if there was 31 days in the month. Yeah. You know, that, that, was, that was what it was. <laughs> and you, well. and, yeah. And you also, you, to get in there, you had to prove you were gay by either kissing the boy you were with, or if you were a lesbian, you'd have to tell them what magazines you, you read yeah. and, and who the editor of the magazine was, because obviously if you didn't know the editor of the magazine, then you'd not read the magazine properly. Yeah. It was, it was barbaric. It was bizarre. So I wanted to change all that. And and it was, it was a case of, you know, I'm, I'm still passionate about Mr. Gay UK now um, because I still think there's a lot of people. And again, we didn't have social media back then, you know, of so course. we didn't have all the, the, the support networks. And there was people who emailed me that I'm still in touch with today um, who just needed support. And there was no mechanism for that. So, so that was why I was passionate about Mr. Gay UK. And then I did an article for Attitude magazine. Um, and I spoke about the Air Force and I spoke about everything I loved about it and I knew it wasn't the government uh, sorry I knew it wasn't the Air Force fault it was the government and then what was really good was in they came to me in 2002 to ask how they could promote uh, promote gays and lesbians because the ban got lifted on the 12th of January 2000 yes. um, so now it was a case of okay the ban's you know the ban's been lifted but there's still not no one's really out uh, it was very much uh, a case of people starting to be themselves so they came to me and we, in 2004, was the very first time that the Air Force marched in a pride parade and that was Manchester. But yeah. whenever you read anything on any, any sort of the armed forces documentation, it'll always say it was 2008 in London. Yeah, um, they always and they forget. Seem to forget they, they always forget the fact that actually, no, it was four years earlier, it was in Manchester and I've got the photos to prove it. Good. Um, Good. And I remember, Sky, I remember Sky News doing an interview with me on the day in Albert Square and it was Martin Popperwell. And he turned around and was like, a, you know, do you not feel disgusted the way that you were treated? And, and, mm. and I was like, no, I feel that this is a massive step forward. You know, we should be grateful that, that they have moved on with the times rather than it just be a case of, you know, we can always look back, we can always be bitter, we can always be angry. That's what, true. What, what's, the, what's the sense in that? So, and I think that sort of picked up a little bit where, where you were coming from before. It's like, you know, I, I think I've always tried to be positive about things. So kind of what I'm seeing there is um, the beginning of a political career for you. Yeah, yeah. So in 2005, I was living back in the city centre and, and I found myself moaning about uh, the state. The bins were overflowing, the canal looked shocking, um, you know, lights were out, the people parking in cycle lanes, all the little niff naff and trivia things that used to wind me up and I think wind most people up on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. And I just thought, you know what, rather than moan about it, do something about it. Mm. So that's what got me involved in, uh, in local politics. Um, I was brought up with Labour as a kid. Um, and, you know, I follow Labour values. And I'm very much, I was very much um, part of the, the new Labour uh, situation with Tony Blair and, and yeah. the way that, and I, you know, I, I, fully, I, I was part of that. So I, I joined the, the Labour Party in in Manchester and I, I then stood in I originally stood in 2010 after spending two years campaigning in Burnage um lived then what was is campaigning I mean I mean I'm intrigued knocking. right so campaigning was a case of knocking on doors um doing the litter picks asking people if they've got any issues in the local area and then picking them up and then fighting that or, or taking that issue and getting it resolved so quite often I would campaign, I'd, I'd, I would go, I literally would knock on people's doors Saturdays and Sundays just to ask, is there anything, you know, are you happy with anything? Is there anything that's bothering you in your local street? You know, do you need, people would say they want the trees cut down. People would say there's a box junction there that's not been painted. So these are all the little things that used to annoy me. So if it annoyed yeah. me, then I understood where they were coming from. So it was about trying to get those issues resolved. Because I've always been a big believer that you should li you, you should live in the, the ward that you represent. Absolutely, because one hundred. And and, and, I, and I say that for councillors and for for MPs. I think anybody, if you're if you're representing 
uh, an area, you have to be there. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, when, when I was on the council, I could leave my house at six o'clock in the morning and I could see that the fact that the bus shelter has been smashed in. I could have it reported before people have even got to for the breakfast. True. But you're aware of it. Whereas I know some councillors who live in North Manchester who represent South Manchester who would only come once a month. Mm. And it's like, well, how, how is that being a representative for your, yeah. for your work? How do you know how people are living? How do you know yeah. what the difficulties or challenges are? How do you know how the circulation moves, traffic, all of that, if you don't live in the area and experience it? Yeah, so, so I moved to Burnage. Um, and then, so I lived, I moved here. And then the I, I lost, the first time I did it, I didn't, I lost the result by 183 but the Lib Dems had a majority of 1,600 the year before. So I'd got it down to 183. The following year, I continued, and I managed to get a majority of nearly 2,000. Um, so I knew that living in the ward made a massive difference. Yeah. And also continuing working on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I really, it was for me, it wasn't about, it didn't really matter about the party. Because um, for me, um, it's about making sure that you're just doing the right things for the area that you're living. Um, and so I, while I was in the council, so I got elected in 2011. And then I, I then realized that, you know, back in the eighties and early nineties, I think that Manchester was really good when it came to LGBT equality. Um, and I think they lost the way in the late nineties and, and early two thousands. Mm. So for me, it was very much a case of like, you know, we need to get that back. We need to get that trust back. We need to sort of get, you know, we need to be realizing and doing things for, for our community. So I stood as uh, to be the lead for LGBT gay men. And I got that. And then I also thought that actually, you know, I looked at this room and, and in, in this room, it was all the, the Lord Mayors of Manchester. And they're there to be, you know, they're the first citizen of the city to represent the community. Yeah. And I looked at it and they just looked, you know, they all looked sort of 65, 70 plus. And <clears throat> it made me think that is not representative of our city. So I then put myself forward and people thought, you know, what, why are you putting yourself forward for that? You know, you've not been on the council that long. I'd only been on uh, about six years at the time. And I was like, well, no, because, you know, I know the city very well. I know the people. I've, I've been a part of this city for, for many years. You know, I've born here, brought up, I've done, I've lived north, south, east Manchester. Um, so that, no, I'm going to go for it. Anyway, I, I missed out the first time I did it in 2015 by one vote. So when I went for it again in 2016, I won it with a majority. I think it was, I think I was 58 and 32. So yeah, I became the first openly, well, I came the first youngest Lord Mayor, mm -hmm. but then also um, made a point of being the first openly gay Lord Mayor. Now the council didn't want to say um, openly gay Lord Mayor. They just pressed out a field day with it. Yeah, so, so yeah, but they, they were scared because then if, if they said first open the gay lord mayor then there might have been the question well if you had another gay lord mayor but there's not been open mm. so, and, but for me i wanted to i just i wanted it to be open there because i felt look i've got shoulders that i i, I can carry this off i also want to raise awareness i want to raise that profile but at the same time if i didn't say that i'd been open the gay lord mayor um the mail on sunday would have run a story absolutely the new lord mayor of manchester uh gay because of Mr. Gay UK, it had been porn, shock, horror. They'd have, yeah. they'd have, they'd have, they'd have worded it in completely different, different uh, mm -hmm. uh, direction. And I think the council was scared of that. But I then decided to take that into my own hands. And from day one, I was completely transparent about everything. I gave um, Jen Williams at the MEN a full, full exclusive sort of interview, um, completely open about everything and also... Um, I got in touch with Mr. Gay UK, Terry George, to sort of ask him about the photographs. And as long as they were being used in the right way, he gave me full rights to all the photographs for Mr. Gay UK that, I, that he took of me. Yeah. Because um, I just felt that it had to be done in a certain way, because if it hadn't have been done, it could have gone terribly wrong. As long as you tell this story, then there's nothing that's going to come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah, exactly. And I think, and then from day one, I, I, I think at first I thought that I wasn't going to get invited to like, you know, the churches, the temples, the mosques, mm. the synagogues, especially the schools, because they'd be like, you know, we don't want this, this, this open the game and coming in and talk, talk. But do you know what? It opened up so many doors. Yeah. Um, because it was, it, was, it was at that time when, you know, I made something of the Lord Mayor, because a lot of people didn't even know we had a Lord Mayor in the city. Um, mm. And it was, you're the first citizen 
Normally you do about 350 engagements. Um, between us, well, I did 1126. Um, and Simon came with me on a lot of them, my husband. Um, and it was a case of like, just being, just be yourself. And, yeah. you know, and, and I, re I remember um, going to uh, the mosque on Cheetah Mill Road and breaking Eid um, and put some on social media. The Guardian picked up on it, ran this story about how multicultural Manchester is and the fact it's of beautiful. how brilliant. Yeah, and it was, and it, it, it's things like that. And to sort of, you know, raise awareness about LGBTQ plus people because that was what my aim was. But I realized very, very quickly, I didn't really have to keep doing that because there's LGBTQ plus people in every walk of life. You know, we've just had the census, um, you know, that, that took place. And for years, we've always talked about Greater Manchester having 220,000 people who identify as LGBTQ plus. That's the same size of people when it comes to Rochdale. So we've got 10, you know, we're a 10. Yeah. Um, of, of Greater Manchester and when we look at Greater Manchester we've got nearly three million people living here and then you look at Wales and there's only just over three million people in the whole of Wales mm. so I think for, 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 for Greater Manchester itself for, for a conurbation I think we're very lucky and we shouldn't forget that but we need there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. When would you say that moment was when you thought I would probably I've say I've got nothing to hide I would probably say after I left the fire service. I remember, I remember when the night when Queer as Folk came out, uh, and the next night I was in work, and we were all lined up, and then you could ask people questions, and someone just sort of said, "I'd like to ask Austin, Austin, what what's rimming?" And I just said, "It's where you lick, it's licking ass," and that just sort of it broke down the barriers. Then yeah. because Queer as Folk for me broke down so many barriers. But can we talk about your liking for Russell T Davis? I am, I am in, in absolute awe of Russell. Um, Paul Graham, who was doing a show on BBC Radio Manchester, uh, he was trying to do this pilot program called Strange Fruit. Yeah. Um, he had he had Russell on it. He had Julie Hesmanhald on it, and Roxy Hart was on it, and yeah. he had me and this other lad to sort of bring Roxy on this um, uh, little sort of stretcher type thing, and Russell was there. Uh, being interviewed and I just met Russell I just I, I just from that moment I was just in awe of him um because I you know with with what he'd done with Queer as Folk um but then have it we then we then went for dinner um with Russell I went, I went for dinner with him and then started talking about everything else and you know we became very good friends and then you know I learned about the whole sort of children's ward that he wrote children's ward which mm. was a part of you know we spoke previous about Boothall Hospital. You know, it was filmed in Boothall Hospital where I spent a lot of my childhood in the six weeks holidays. Um, and, you know, he wrote Why Don't You? And he wrote all these children programs that, that people wouldn't even think of someone yeah. like Russell. So then with, with that, and then with Queer as Folk and the way that, you know, everyone could see themselves as characters, I just think he did, he did an amazing job. And, and it, it, that to me was, was the start of, acceptance for a lot of gay people and I think you know I know so many people who moved to Manchester who came to University of Manchester because of Queer as Folk. Totally. I know that's I know, I know it brought hen parties I know it brought a different group of people as well but um, it started debate and it, it got the gay scene on the international map um, mm. and then from that he then did like Bob and Rose and then I remember we went out for dinner a few years after that and I spoke about the fact of uh, I think we'd, we'd, we were talking about something else, and I think I was mentioned about the fact of, you know, what, gay men, you know, they're so happy when other relationships fail. You know, mm -hmm. we, we knew he was talking about this, and that's where cucumber came from mm -hmm. from that from, from that discussion. And yeah, he's done some some amazing things from Doctor Who, and um, and obviously now he's years you know, and he's, years with, with it's, it's yeah years <clears throat> and years. And again, when you watched years and years. And then we looked six months down the line what was going on. Yeah, it's it was like... Had, it's as if he had that vision. It's like Nostradamus. It's, it was like the 2020 Nostradamus, 20, 2019 Nostradamus yeah. prophecy. It was just scary how accurate. I'd love to know how he researched that show because everything was spot on. Everything. And that, it was. And it, it, and what, what was so weird if you think about other things that he's done so obviously that that program but then the, the following program and that program was called years and years 
And that was that was probably done in the stages. That must have been written, what, 2017, 18? Yeah. Because these sort of things. And then obviously he then started to write It's a Sin. But then the main character out of It's a Sin is in a band called Years and Years. Yeah. Yeah, nice, no, it's just it? It, 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 it is. <laughs> little Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah, and, and I just think you know the, the, the amount of things that must go through that man's head. And then what was also beautiful in um, uh, in one of the uh, series of, of It's a Sin, he reads his dialogue about um, all these people who about uh, who were gay, but they're not. You know, no one ever questioned uh, about who they were. Actually, what what's lovely about that is. We, uh, when we got married, myself and Simon, in 2015, um, Russell wrote our wedding speech. And oh, our wedding gorgeous. speech is what is in, what is in, um, it's, it's a sin in that little Wow. That, that, that must have been weird so, watching that. How did that feel? It was because I was just like, we were watching it and I was just like, that's, that was our speech that, that he wrote years ago. And he, and he said that, so I questioned him about it. He says, yeah, I hope you didn't mind. He said, but it was so important. I just wanted to put it in there. Everyone was in tears. You know, even yeah. even the registrar was in tears reading this 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 this, this monologue, um, which was beautiful. Oh so, yeah, my that, word! So there it is. That's, there that's, it that's is. my that's my love of, of, of Russell um, and and everything that he's achieved. What was your experience of okay, so, being the first LGBT and youngest out mayor of Manchester? I think one thing that was really sort of powerful was the fact that it, it opened up so many doors and I think yeah. the fact that I was so accommodating as well and also I wanted I wanted to to kick it into touch and I wanted to bring it down a level you know and I, it was very much a case of you know even any charity events I decided that I was going to do as much as possible and um, the the office wouldn't well, you know they were very strict on the chains and everything so I was like well fine so I ended up having the chains printed on t-shirts um to do charity events and yeah you know lovely. i'd go i'd go to but also i was the first person as well that because normally if you'd be wearing um like a morning suit with the gray mm -hmm. trousers with a black line down them and a waist i was like no I've, I've got my own suits thank you um if i'm going to you know do, would i wear that just because i'm, I'm going to a school no because yeah. it's a barrier straight away yeah. So even some things, you know, I'd wear shorts and t-shirt with the chain. So it was about breaking down them barriers and wearing my own suits. And, and I remember I remember doing um, something for, oh, what they called the Rotary Club. And I went to the, it was at Manchester Central. And I went to do their opening session. So I was there on stage, sort of give, give the, the whole sort of opening, rang the bell. Anyway, this guy... Um, put a message on social media saying how disgusted I was um, that the Lord Mayor of Manchester had turned up not wearing a tie, wearing an orange shirt with a blue suit and brown shoes. And it was it was that a surreal, a surreal moment when you're thinking, someone really sort of commented in that way, you know, it was yeah. smart, it looked, it looked good, you know, I've, I've got yeah. pictures of it. It's now. President Obama in a brown suit. <laughs> Yeah, and it was very, it was just like, but then other people sort of got, got on, on, on it um, and then started tweeting the, the, the whole Rotary Club, Rotary UK, Rotary Ireland, uh, in solidarity, showing pictures of the brown shoes. I went to a primary school and I told them my story about when I was in the Air Force. Um, I didn't say that I'd been kicked out for being gay, I just said, and then I left and, you know, so I didn't yeah. want to sort of, I didn't feel it was my place to, to sort of put that on, on in that conversation. So I finished off my, my sort of 20 minute talk. Uh, the head teacher was there. Anyway, anyone want any questions? What did it feel like to be thrown out of the Air Force for being gay? Are they so like good or... Yeah, <laughs> everyone, and, and he, he literally turned around and said, you know, people have Googled you, they've done the homework. Then the next question was, um, I believe you're married to a man. I've got two mummies. And it was just like, this is brilliant. And it, and it made me realize, you know what? This is where education is key and the fact that, you know, we need to be teaching young people. We need to probably teach teaching schools every year for the next 50 years to get rid of uh, a generation where they still have an issue with, with yeah. gay people. Well, that's Clause 28. Kids. That's that's yeah. coming off the back of Clause 28. You know. Exactly. <clears throat> and, and I, I, you know, we're both lucky because because we didn't actually go through Clause 28. You know, I left school in 1988. Yeah. 
and, yeah. and that you know it was repealed in 2003 um i mean i remember my sex education at school it was with a cucumber and a condom and that i didn't it. even have one and and I that you know, and one. that was it <clears throat> um and they definitely so, didn't talk about anything to do with gay when i went through school oh no it was there just was, was... invisible yeah yeah then you know they were the you wouldn't even, it wouldn't even have been discussed. The only time you, the word gay was used was when it was someone saying that someone was gay, but yeah. no one really knew what it meant. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I, I think I, I took a lot out of that and managed to sort of um, achieve a lot out of being uh, the Lord Mayor. Um, I think the Labour Party didn't specifically like it. Um, I ended up getting deselected from the Labour Party when I was standing uh, again the following year because my year was due up in 2018 but what had also happened is there'd been a, a boundary change um in that time we'd also changed um leaders so jeremy mm -hmm. corbyn is now mm -hmm. leader um and our membership for for burnage the membership when i first started was about 48 people it was now something like 700 and something when jeremy wow. corbyn took over um, and I made it quite clear I wasn't a Jeremy Corbyn fan. Um, I, you know, I think he's, um, his manifesto was brilliant, but it was a bit like the Lib Dem manifesto in 2010. It just wasn't deliverable. Um, and I think you can say anything you want to say if you're not going to be in power. Um, so I just, you know, and I didn't like his, his bully boy tactics. Um, and I made that quite clear. And mm -hmm. because we got the boundary change. And it now means that I actually live opposite, on the opposite side of the road to the boundary. Um, and because I've, I'm very vocal about that. So, yeah, but I always think of things happen for a reason. Um, mm. And then because of that, um, because I came off the council, I was then able to do the job that Andy Burnham um, asked me to do. And that was to yeah. be the LGBT advisor to the mayor of Greater Manchester and the Combined Authority. So that's now working with all the Temblers um across greater manchester to to have a voice you know i think everyone's got uh, their own views their own opinions when it comes to politics um and i think that that that's that's right but i also think that when you're there to represent um 220 000 people who represent you know across greater manchester you know um i don't think that me screaming labor policy or tory policy or lib dem policy at people is, is going to be helpful yeah. Whereas I think that, that, you know, as long as the right things are being done for the right reasons, then that's all that should matter. Have <clears> you <throat> got a view on how Manchester and particularly the gay village um, can move forward into the next year's 20, 30 years? What's happening in terms of regeneration? Well, I'd like to see um some cafe shops i'd like to see some little art galleries i'd like to see a bookshop i'd like to see the community actually come together um with a bit of community space uh places that people go not necessarily just to go out on a on a night to get drunk um and just be wet uh, just just beer i, I, I want to see it actually come together as a community yeah how can it become a community hub like what kind of things need to be in place when they start looking at because there was talk about pulling down that multi-storey car park that's at the back of, um, you know, the Bruntwood Tower. Jordan Street. Yeah, Jordan Street, that one. Now, what people seem to forget is the fact that that was actually going to be a department store when it was first being built, but they ran mm -hmm. out of money. So that's why it's got that ramp thing up it. Right. Um, so that that wasn't that was never meant to be a car park. Um, but and then people have criticised the fact that the, the Thompson's Arms had been knocked down because of the fact of if they got rid of that. But actually, the Thompson's Arms is built there and the car park's built around it. So yeah. you could get away with, with leaving that in, in situ as well. But I, I do think, think you have to keep we... the Thompson's Arms because that's yeah. just a, yeah, no, that's a personal preference for me. But that's where my gay experience started. And yeah, from it's always been, and all that sort yeah. Of stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and also the the actual the sort of fabric of the village is built on on the, those sort of venues. Mm -hmm. Now you know I think what Brunt would have done down on on Oxford Road with the with the uh, with the, the sort of porter cabin type things, you know, even something like that would be really good to sort of mm -hmm. give let people be independent. Let's like you know I remember um, when you mean Julia like a Black... hatch thing like that yeah, yeah, very sort much of... like hatch yeah. But I also remember when. Um, um, See, Ter Terry King, he, he came up with the Emporium, which used to be um, Icarus, 
with her Hollywood show bar. Yeah. Um, and he had like, the, you know, Julia Grant had a cafe in there and he had the shops and, and they had the hairdressers and they had the pottery and they had the sunbed shop. And I think, you know, it had a gallery, it had like a fashion place. It was a bit like a mini Affleck. Yeah. And I think, you know, we could do that with sort of the hatch sort of situation in that area. Um, and again, it, it had modernised the, the area. And I think because the people that, that built the village, and I say well, that, that, I mean, as in the fact that the older people who like your, your Peter Daltons, your, your Nigel Mike Smiths, you know, the, your, 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 um, your Tony Coopers, you know, you might, the, all those sort of people are getting older and we actually want something to do now. We want to go and have mm -hmm. a coffee. We don't mm -hmm. just want to go and get drunk every night. Is so there any call for a green space as well? Would that be part of the plan or? I think would it? it would be, I think it would be, I think it would be useful, but you just, you, I think we, if we could invest more in Sackville Gardens and get, and get that up to a, to a better standard, yes. first of all, yeah. um, I think it would be great. I, what I'd love to see at the bottom of Sackville Gardens is rather than every sort of time you have an event that we, we, we sort of put up a, um, a, a stage, I'd like to see something purpose built at that bottom yeah. end that, that would save thousands of pounds every year because you've yeah. only got something purpose built, like a, yeah. a little mini stage, a bit like what they've got at Castlefield. I think uh, in reality, I think it needs a good jet wash, first of all, <laughs> I think. And, and I've said this with, with, with you know, the, the council, I think even tidying it up would make yeah. a massive difference. Even the bins look groggy. I want to talk about your, um, your experience clubbing and what it is to be proud of Manchester and what it is to feel gay pride in Manchester. So, so. I, so even though when I was in the Air Force and I'd come back to Manchester, I'd very rarely, very rarely be able to give that opportunity to go out because I was too scared of, of, uh, of being outed. But I used to go into, um, so I'd end up going to Manto. I'd end up going to sort of New York, New York, the Union, yeah. but very sort of, uh, sort of back, back step um, until sort of 97. But then in 97, um, once I'd sort of come out of the Air Force and I was working nights at ASDA, I remember Saturday night, I would finish work at about quarter to 12. I'd get in my car from Berry because uh, I was working over at ASDA Berry. Um, and then just get to, to Paradise Factory and get there for, for midnight. And Elton Elf, and Lee on the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, and it would be. And uh, I made friends very quickly with Peter Dalton. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and I've always had the, the utmost respect for Peter. And I think, I don't know what it is, but I've done, I think I've done very well in the fact that, you know, I managed to become friends with like Peter Dalton, Carol. You know, I came friends very quickly with, with Nigel Martin Smith, came, you know, and, and the people that sort of were part of the fabric of the city, Julia Grant, you know, even yes. with Julia and, and stuff. And I remember even, in fact, even when I was in the Air Force, I came back and I'd, I'd go to Dickens sometimes. So I'd go to New York, New York. Then you, I'd, I'd, Frank uh, Fufu Lamar uh, I would have a conversation because it was some relation of some, some, someone in the family who, who happened to mention me, who we, we ended up some random conversation. But then he looked after, you know what I mean? He was a bit like taking me under his wing a little bit. Yeah. And then, you know, Dick, Dickens, you'd have to knock on the door, go up that really steep staircase. Um, to what was, basically, it was just like a working men's club up there with, yeah. with a lot of feather boas. Yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, people, again, people won't ever see that. You know, I no. remember the New, New York, New York, sorry, the New Union, before it had the extension built and there was that little car park there. And on a Sunday, you'd be sat on Chesterfields um, and you'd have to, they did bring food out because they weren't allowed by, by law to, to stay open unless you had food. And you'd have Roxy singing in a, uh, in a fire exit. And then you'd go from there, you'd go to Napoleon's or, or yeah. And, and it was very much like that. It was a bit, bit like you'd go around and just drinking out of cans of breaker. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I didn't and laugh, you know, but I, I mean, it's just, that just sealed it in time, the break. <laughs> <laughs> like well, Purdy's, uh, you know, that's yeah. just like. <laughs> but, but there were so many characters in the village then. There were so many characters, you know, Tony Dean in, in Paradise Factory, um, you know, he'd come in in, in his suit. Um, so is and, there a song that represents that period for you? Uh, so. A song that represents that period, it's different from what I would normally go with, but a song, it was uh, Dario G, Sunshine. Oh, wow, really? Okay. So, yeah, 
because I remember that um, was was just out at that time of me actually going to to uh, to paradise. So me, that that was one of the, the the songs of that time of coming out. But I think when I was younger, one of the main sort of songs that, that sort of struck a chord was Jimmy Somerville and Bronski beat with with Small Town Boy. Totally. Um, yeah. And I think you know because I think that was what I think it was 1984, so I'd be about 12 then. And it was that time when I was going through my head about, you know, what am I, you know, this whole sort of denial thing and and seeing him at the, on that train, but then when he goes around the changing rooms in the in the swimming pool and he, he sort of sees, his, his mates sort of encourage him to sort of flirt a little bit with another guy that's in there. Yeah. So then that guy to then get, get him in an alleyway and then they sort of beat him up. Uh, mm -hmm. as a homophobic mm -hmm. attack mm -hmm. and then you've got the co uh, the policeman bringing Jimmy back to his, his mum and dad Parents, yeah. um, and, and, and then you, and then you see the fact that you know there's the whole family shame there the mum gives him a you know the dad wants to disown him and it, it, it sort of played a part thinking is that what my life's going to be like mm -hmm. and again I, I can relate that to sort of you know in a, in a sense me running away joining the air force everything packed up in a bag to go on a train yeah. To then, to then years later, have it all just thrown back at me. Now, as an adult, then, how's your enjoyment of gay culture, gay life in Manchester, and is there a song that can represent that? I'm going to go with you know, it's a sin from from um, Ollie Alexander with years and years, and I think yeah. the reason for that is any song that you, you listen to, you can interpret in in any way you want to interpret. Now. Mm. I know from the from sort of from when Pet Shop Boys wrote this song, it was very much um, about what, you know it was a bit of tongue in cheek. It was supposed to be a bit of campness in there to sort of say sod you to the authorities. Yeah. It, you know, it was brought up in the Catholic school, and it was all about the fact of you know it was always a sense of shame that he couldn't be who he wanted to be. So, and that, and then you sort of go through life, and, and you're listening to the words, and, and sort of the amount of emotion and frustration that, that you can have as growing up and being told, you know, it's a sin to be that way. It's a sin mm. to be the way that you are. But then as you get older and you're thinking that, why should I feel a sense of shame of who I am? And I think the way that Ollie has sang that song right now um, is just as powerful today, if it, you know, than it was 30 years ago. It's about believing in yourself. It doesn't matter. It, 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 if you've sinned, you've enjoyed yourself because you've been true to yourself. Mm, mm. Um, and, and that's the way I interpret that song. It's about the fact of just, just believe in yourself. Um, it, there is no shame in, in being LGBTQ plus, um, however we will identify. You know, life itself, it shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't just come under this term. I know there's a lot of people offended by the word queer or people offended by uh, different acronyms yeah. um, and, and the words we said before, but let people just identify the way that they want to identify. You know, let them just be themselves. At the end of the day, we're all human beings and it's about respect. And is there a record that represents that for your future? So what's next well, I think, for you? I, I, as in for what's next for me, I don't know. Um, um, you know, I'm, we're married, you know, we've got Simon, uh, we've got daughter, she's, um, she's two coming up to a two-year-old. Um, you know, I remember as a kid, again, my mom, one of the things my mum was always found really hard was the fact that she was upset because, you know, I was, I was this seven-year-old boy who wanted to get married and have children, but she knew being gay that I could never get married and have children. Well, I have got married. I mean, I have <laughs> children. So I, yeah. You know, we, we have moved on and we've managed to, we've, we've you know, we, we've managed to achieve a lot in a short amount of time when you look back on history, but there's still a lot to do. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that, <clears throat> you know, I was awarded uh, the OBE uh, for, for work with charity and, and LGBTQ plus equality, but, and also became a, a deputy lieutenant of Greater Manchester. But the thing is, what I want to do with that is I want to use it to enhance and to do more for communities mm -hmm. and to do more with, with, with society because, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful I've got them and I know that I want to have achieved them without people just believing in me, just trusting me. But I am going to go back to, to a 1984 uh, classic uh, and it is I Am What I Am by oh, Gloria amazing. Gaynor. 
And the reason for that is, you know, I think it's, it emphasizes that, that we are all individual. You know, I remember listening to this even back, you know, I'd be driving from home, going back to the RAF and driving back from the RAF. And I'd have this song full blast, windows out, screaming it out at the top of my voice that, you know, I am what I am. I don't want praise. I will bang my own drum. You know, some think it's noise. I do think it's pretty. And I think that even though that song, um, what, I was 11, 12 when it first came out, that song still is as powerful now, nearly 30, 40 years later for me. Um, and, and that is my anthem, I think. And I know it's cheesy. Uh, Not I know cheesy it's at all. But I'm I think actually we should really all, moved. <clears throat> we, we, we should all celebrate who we are. And none of us need any excuse to be ourselves. Mm, that's a beautiful ending. I, you are an extraordinary person. You're a real warrior. And I am honoured to have you sitting in front of me. And I am thankful that you are there as an advisor and can hopefully get things done and change things in a really beautiful and positive way for Manchester. Thank you for joining me on here, here no, Carl. And I wish you pleasure. the absolute best. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. Thank you so much. Take care, Lots my love. love. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.